I'll go ahead and introduce the speaker. Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, let me welcome Curtis Kent from Brigham Young University, who will be speaking on lacunary properties of cat zero groups slash spaces. Take it away. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to, to talk today and I appreciate the, um, you taking your time to be here and to listen. So as was mentioned, I'll be talking about lacunary properties of cat zero spaces. And I hope, I'm not gonna define lacunary right now. It will come in kind of in the middle of the talk. We'll explain what we mean by lacunary. Um, so I hope you'll bear with me while we get there. Um, the main goal of our talk is kind of to study the relationship between the coarse geometry of a cat zero space. And in case I forget to mention it throughout the talk, I'm always gonna be assuming my cat zero spaces are proper and have a, um, a co-compact action, that the, the isometry group acts co-compactly on the space. I don't, I'm not going to assume a geometric action for most of the things we'll talk about. So I don't really care about properly discontinuously, but I will require that it has a co-compact action. So our goal is to understand the relationship between cat zero spaces and their coarse geometry, the teeth boundary of a cat zero space and the asymptotic cones of a cat zero space. So we'll start by kind of briefly giving you an idea of what teeth boundaries and asymptotic cones are. Um, probably will kind of do it an injustice, but I hope that it'll give you enough of flavor if you haven't seen them before that you'll be able to follow what we're doing. So for cat zero space, we'll define the boundary as the set of based geodesic rays. So I'll take all geodesic rays at a fixed base point and then I need to topologize them. And there, there are two um, standard ways to topologize the set of based rays. The first way is that, well, two geodesics, if these are two geodesics, they will be close if they fellow travel for a long ways. And that will be called the visual boundary or the visual topology on the boundary. So if you're looking at R, you have two geodesic rays, one wa walk in each direction, they go opposite directions. And so, you're basically just getting the zero sphere, sphere, two discrete points. And if you look at R squared and you look at the set of geodesic rays, well, you're getting kind of a circle's worth of rays. And it turns out with the visual topology, it's, it is a topological circle. If you take the hyperbolic plane here as well, you get the same answer. You get a, um, the boundary with the visual topology is a um, simple closed curve. Now, if you look at say the Cayley graph on the free group of two generators, there are lots of geodesic rays here and it depends on which path you choose at every, um, every vertex. And as long as you never choose to go backwards, you'll get a geodesic ray. And in the end, what are you getting? You're getting a camera set worth of points. And so that's with the visual boundary. But the problem is kind of what we don't like is the the Euclidean plane and the hyperbolic plane are about as different geometrically as you could hope for. But this boundary, the visual boundary doesn't distinguish between them. And so we will want to consider the, the teeth boundary, which will be the main focus of my talk today would be the teeth boundary. And the teeth boundary is the, the topology you get on the boundary when you consider the geodesic metric induced by the angle metric. The angle metric just says the distance between two geodesic rays, remember all my geodesic rays are based at a single point, is just the limit of the comparison angles. So I'm looking at the comparison angles, I'm looking at that angle right there, as I allow T to march off to infinity. And that limit will be um, the, the angle between two metrics, or I mean the, the angle between two geodesics. And then the distance between two geodesics would be the, minimal, the length of the minimal path between them. Well, there might not be a path between them, in which case the distance will be infinity. So what you want to think about is the teeth metric kind of interprets the path components are things where I can go from one to the other in some nice Euclidean fashion. And then the path, then distinct path components means there's no way to get from this geodesic ray to that geodesic ray in a, in a kind of a Euclidean way. It says they're very different. They, the different directions entirely. And we'll be more precise about that in a little bit, okay? 
So properties, well, really the visual boundary, while kind of natural and classical, it's not really a group property. Croak Kleiner were able to show that there exists a nice um, cat zero group that acts geometrically on two cat zero spaces with non homeomorphic visual boundaries. So even up to homeomorphism, the boundary isn't a property of the group, it's just a property of the cat zero space. This is a very classical example and, and very interesting. And lots of people spend a lot of time thinking about this example. Specifically, she also was able to show that if I take this example, and rather than consider the, um, the visual boundary, I consider the boundary with the Tietz topology, the Tietz boundary. Well, then the part that matters about the boundary, the, the, path, the large path component is actually by Lipschitz, regardless of which um, cat zero space you're acting upon. Sort of, I, I cheated there a little bit, but, but that's okay. Um, and then the other components of the Tietz boundary are either points or intervals. And so you can match them up nicely. So in some sense, the Tietz boundary is a better, um, a better boundary for the Kroh Kleiner example, because it's kind of, it's a property of the group and not necessarily just a property of the space on which the group is acting. Okay, so asymptotic cones. Um, if, you pro if you've never seen asymptotic cones before, this might not be that enlightening, but we'll try anyway for a 20 minute talk, we'll see what we can do. Um, so you want to understand the course geometry of your space by looking at your space as you walk farther and farther away from the, the space, okay? So imagine as you're flying away from your, your metric space, you look back. Things that were one time far apart get closer and closer together as you fly away. And you wanna take the limit as you do this. What does that mean? Well, that means I need to scale my distances. So I choose a sequence of numbers, d sub n, that diverge to infinity. And then I look at sequences of points. And I look at all the sequence of, sequences of points. And then I say the distance between two sequences of points is the, the limit of the distances of the coordinates when I scale by these larger and larger numbers. But the problem is, um, one, this doesn't have to be bounded, and two, it doesn't have to converge. So to make it be bounded, you have to fix an observation sequence. And when you fix this observation sequence, then I restrict myself to sequences which are close to that observation sequence, and I throw all the others away. So that makes all the sequences bounded, Make, makes this a bounded set of numbers for every sequence inside of my, my cone. But bounded sequences don't converge. So you pull out your favorite magic wand and you take omega, which is an ultra filter. And for this purpose of this talk, you don't have to know anything about ultra filters other than they make this make sense. This limit will always um, converge when I look at the omega limit. So omega is just the magic wand that makes um, bounded sequences converge. And then you need to identify all the sequences which are zero distance apart. So with that very formal definition, um, you're like, I have no idea what an asymptotic cone is. So let's at least look at a couple of trivial examples. If you take the real numbers or um, R to the N with the Euclidean metric and you scale it, what do you get? You still get R to the N. So every time I looked back from my spaceship flying away from my space, I saw the same um, Euclidean space. So the limit is the Euclidean space. Nothing happened, right? But let's take a non-trivial example, a slightly non-trivial example. Let's take like Z2 with the nice, with the canonical word metric Z2. I can imagine Z2 embedded in the plane as the integer lattice in the plane. And then when I scale the metric by one half, now I have that one half integer lattice. And when I scale it by one fourth, I get the one fourth integer lattice and the one eighth integer lattice. And in the limit, I'm getting the whole plane, right? But the problem is at each stage that you get from one point to the other point, you have to go horizontally then vertical. Doesn't matter how dense the lattice is, at each stage you always had to go up and down, up and down. You could, there was never any diagonals at each limit stage, in each stage of the limit, before the limit. Therefore, you're getting the, the, um, the Euclid, you're getting the plane, but you're not getting the Euclidean metric, you're getting the taxicab metric. So if I take Z to the N with, any, with the canonical word metric, and then I look at its, any of its asymptotic cones, it'll always be um, R to the N with the taxicab metric. Now, if I take a hyperbolic group or hyperbolic space, 
Well, then I have this uniform number that every triangle, doesn't matter how big my triangle is, every triangle has a uniformly um, bounded min size, okay? But then as I start scaling by larger and larger numbers, that min size, after I start scaling, it goes to zero. So in the limit, every triangle in the limit is a tripod. And a, a metric space where every um, triangle is a tripod is a tree. Not a simplicial tree, but it's a tree. There's a unique path between any two points. Unique um, shortest path, unique arc between any two points. And it turns out you can actually classify um, hyperbolic groups this way. A group will be hyperbolic if and only if every asymptotic cone is an R tree. Okay. So we had these three things we chose. We chose an observation sequence, we chose a ultra filter, we chose a scaling sequence. And given those three inputs, the output was an asymptotic cone. Well, then you have to ask yourself, how much do these outputs matter? Well, if your um, space or group has a geometric action or a co-compact action, the observation sequence doesn't matter. They'll all be by Lipschitz, independent or isometric even, independent of your observation sequence. But it turns out that the, the ultra filter and the scaling sequence, they matter and they matter a lot. Um, in 2000, Thomas and Velikovic showed that there are finitely generated groups with non-homeomorphic asymptotic cones. Specifically, they were able to show that there is an asymptotic cone, which is an R tree, and an asymptotic cone, which is not simply connected. Oshansky and Sapir were able to show the same thing for finitely presented groups. And again, their example was by considering their fundamental groups. And they had different fundamental groups, the asymptotic cones. Um, Kramer, Shalah, Kent, and Thomas showed that some semi-simple um, Lie groups, for example, SL3R, have unique asymptotic cones when the continuum hypothesis holds, and lots of non-homeomorphic asymptotic cones when the continuum hypothesis doesn't hold. So this is a lot of this, lots and lots of asymptotic cones, and they're not necessarily the same. And so you have to ask yourself, when is enough just to study one asymptotic cone? And that's kind of the big question that I would like to talk about most of today, is when is it enough to study just one asymptotic cone, or when do I have to see all of them? If you have a finitely generated group, which has an asymptotic cone, which is bounded, then the group is finite, and every asymptotic cone will be bounded. Kapovich and Kleiner showed that a finitely presented group with one asymptotic cone, which is an R tree, is hyperbolic, i.e. all of its asymptotic cones are hyperbolic. As soon as you knew that one asymptotic cone was hyperbolic, one asymptotic cone was a tree, then they all were trees. And they did this in a paper called Lacanary Hyperbolic Groups. Lacanary means sparsely or sparse or missing big gaps. And so they, they characterized all the finitely generated groups that had an asymptotic cone, an R tree, by showing that they were groups where they had a presentation where the relations looked hyperbolic. They had small cancellation properties on all the finite lengths. Of, if you cut the lengths of the relations off at some point, it would look hyperbolic. But then there would be long gaps of no relations, long gaps that were the no relations of those lengths. And then there would be some more relations that again would satisfy some small cancellation conditions. And then they would have long gaps where there were no relations of those lengths. And it turns out that was exactly the set of um, groups, lacanary hyperbolic groups, or groups that had some asymptotic cone, which was an R tree. And Kapovich and Kleiner says that can only happen when your group is not finitely presented, because as soon as you throw on finitely presented, as soon as you get one, one asymptotic cone, which is an R tree, they're all R trees. So um, the same thing holds true when you consider relatively hyperbolic groups. Um, we'll be more precise than that shortly. So if you feel cheated there, I'm sorry. We'll, we'll try and formalize that slightly more than looks like. Okay, so here we go. So this is our, our relationships that we want to study and understand. First of all, we'll have properties of cat zero spaces, delta hyperbolic, we know what that means. Admits a rank one axis, that's a periodic bi-infinite geodesic that doesn't bound a half flat. Isolated flats. What's an isolated flat? We're not gonna give you a formal definition, but you wanna think about isolated flats as being, if you take the set of flats, 
inside of your CAT0 space and you endow them with a compact open topology, the, the set of flats will be a discrete set. Okay, this is a discrete subset of maps into your space, okay, with a compact open topology. Product, we know what that means. Flat means it's a Euclidean space. So those are the properties of CAT0 spaces we're going to look at. The first one, if you're delta hyperbolic, well, then all geodesics are diverging. So it's a discrete metric space. You an R tree, every, one asymptotic cone is an R tree, they're all R trees. If you admit a rank one axis, then that means the teeth diameter, the teeth boundary has an infinite diameter. And it will mean that some point or some asymptotic cone has a cup point and every asymptotic, which will also imply every asymptotic cone has a cup point. So when I when I write this, um, the strongest, the weakest hypothesis is some asymptotic cone has this property. And then the, the theorem is that everyone will, every asymptotic cone will also have that property. Okay. And so um, that all, the, all three of these properties are equivalent. So you delta hyperbolic if and only if your teeth boundary is discrete, if and only if some asymptotic cone is an R tree, if and only if every asymptotic cone is an R tree. So we've talked about. Um, and this is due to Sultan. Um, this is old. It's due to Bauman. Um, I apologize. I'm probably going to masters, massacre his name. Brujalo, maybe. So now let's look at isolated flats. Due to um, Ruska and Kleiner, they're able to show that a cat zero space with a geometric action um, will have isolated flats if and only if the teeth boundary is a disjoint union of points and spheres, if and only if every asymptotic cone is tree grade. So Bruce, um, Ruska and Kleiner, they, they did the every asymptotic cone is tree graded issue. And so we want to talk about tree graded for a second. A geodesic metric space is tree graded. If it looks like a tree, except for some fat things, i.e. there's a, a collection of pieces and any two pieces will intersect in at most one point, and every simple closed curve is contained in a piece. So you could put like a Euclidean space there, and maybe you put a hyperbolic space here, and maybe you put a finite graph there. But anytime I want to get from one piece to another piece, there's a unique way to get there, up to which pieces you travel through. Okay, and um, sorry, my. Why it's got messed up. So that's a tree graded space. Jutu and Sapir were able to show that this exactly character, characterizes the relatively hyperbolic groups. A finally generated group will be relatively hyperbolic if and only if every asymptotic cone is tree graded with respect to limits of cosets of H. So um, Jutu and Sapir did the every case, Cologne, Hall, and myself a couple of years ago. Did the, it's enough to look at one asymptotic cone if you were finitely presented. And I mean, you could weaken this and we do in our paper, but for now, this is, um, this is, gives you a flavor of what's going on. But in both cases, in both cases, we had to require the asymptotic cone is tree graded with respect to limits of the cosets. What we did in um, a new paper, Ricks and I, Russell Ricks and I, we were able to show that you can do better than that for cat zero spaces. That a proper co-compact cat zero space has isolated flats if and only if some asymptotic cone is tree graded with respect to flats. But you notice I don't have to put any hypotheses on how those flats arise. It's easy to, to create flats that are limits of other types of spaces. But just in, as I start scaling things, they look more and more and more Euclidean. But here it says, when Ru in, um, Ruska's and Kleiner's results, they say it must be tree graded with respect to limits of flats. And here we, it's enough to just look at what's in the end. I don't care how these flats arise. As long as I'm tree graded with respect to flats, then I know that my space will have isolated flats. Okay, so that gives me the equivalence of those. And the next one is products and flats. Now I'm gonna cheat here. Um, you have to actually do a little quasi -divin, um dense convex subgroup arguments here. So 
Um, your product, if and only if the teeth boundary is a, a spherical join. Well, no, not actually. If your product that implies the um, teeth boundary is a spherical join, if the teeth boundary is a spherical join, that implies there's some quasi dense convex closed subset, which is a product. Okay. So th that's the best you could hope for. Because you could always take some nice product space and wedge on some finite thing. And you would still have some nice co compact action. The boundary would be unchanged, but I'm no longer product. Okay. And it turns out that um, you can actually distinguish this product structure from looking at one asymptotic cone. And so the asymptotic cone of a product is immediately a product of asymptotic cones. But the other direction is, is false in general, that the asymptotic cone is a product. There's no reason for the base space to be a product in general. There are lots of examples where that's not true. Um, so what we show is that if you look at proper co compact metric spaces and you see your asymptotic cone is a non-trivial product space, then so was some closed convex quasi-dense subgroup of your space. I am almost out of time, so just quickly, um, last thing I want to talk about is if you're flat, so your, your teeth boundary is a sphere and a sphere is compact, it turns out that it's the compact that matters. If your teeth boundary is compact, then you're actually a, you have a containing quasi dense flat. Um, that was originally done by Bosch in an unpublished preprint. Um, it also follows from works, work of Rick and I, or Russell and I. And it also follows from if you have one asymptotic cone, which is proper, then your cat zero space will be flat. So thank you. Okay, let's thank our speaker. Are there any questions for Curtis? <laughs>